June 28th to July 6th, 2010. Do you know that date? It's the last time Queen Elizabeth visited Canada. She was here to celebrate the 100th anniversary of our Navy, and while she was here, she even participated in some Canada Day festivities in Ottawa. Did you know our queen has been to our country for 22 official visits? Yeah, me either. I had to Google that. Google is a beautiful thing. Seven of those were in my lifetime. She's been to Canada more than any other country in the Commonwealth. She's been to every province and territory. She's been here every month of the year except January and February. Wise lady. And full disclosure... I had no idea the queen was here in 2010. <laughs> I was probably playing Xbox. It wasn't until I married into a family from Northern Ireland that I began to understand about our queen and realize how important she is. You may or may not realize the Bible describes Jesus as a king. Today, as I said a little earlier in the service, Christians all over the world are celebrating Palm Sunday. It's the day that Jesus rode into Jerusalem on a donkey, and the crowds were chanting, they were singing, Craig talked about it just a little bit ago, they were singing, Hosanna! And then five days later, that same crowd cried out, Crucify him! But that's Good Friday. John 12 tells the story of Palm Sunday. That's where we're going to be today. You can open up to John 12 in your Bible. If you don't have a Bible with you, uh, we would love to get you one. You can even take the one right in front of you. Keep it. Call it yours. Write your name on the front cover. John 12, page 1532. You'll be right there with us. If you're not really a hardcover person, you can flip it open on your device as well. Uversion app or Google John 12. You'll be right there with us. It's the story of Palm Sunday. I'm sure you, like me, have your perceptions of royalty. Whether that's from Netflix, The Crown, or the tabloids, reading about Harry and Meghan, or some other monarchy in history. But Jesus, Jesus is unlike any other monarch. See, Jesus is a different kind of king. And if we say that, that we're, we're going to follow Jesus, then it's crucial that we understand just what type of king we say we're following. And by the way, you maybe have been tracking along with us this whole series, and you've heard us talk about this theme of the series, Believe. John's whole purpose in writing his gospel, his story about the life of Jesus is that that we would believe in him. And and maybe the whole way you've been just investigating for yourself, you've been kicking the tires on a relationship with Jesus. Well, today, today you get to hear this is exactly who the king is that we say we follow. And and here's what that king asks of us. And so again, if, if we say that we follow Jesus, we're team Jesus, let's figure out what type of king we're following. John chapter 12, follow along as I read, beginning at verse 12. The next day, that's, that's Palm Sunday, five days before Good Friday, the great crowd that had come for the festival heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem. They took palm branches and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Blessed is the King of Israel! And Jesus found a donkey and sat on it. As it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming, seated on a donkey's colt. At first, his disciples did not understand all this. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. Many people, because they heard that he had performed this sign, went out to meet him. So the Pharisees said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. 
Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Let's pray. Father, thank you for sending your Son to be the King, not a King, the one true King. As we read these words, some of them are kind of confusing. For some of us, we we don't really understand this type of king. For all of us, the message Jesus gives us is challenging. And so I pray over these next few minutes as we discuss this passage and what you have to say to us, what it says about you and your son, that we'll begin to understand. We'll realize it is applicable to our lives. It is relevant to our situation. And Lord, we would be humbled by this king. We'd consider it a privilege to serve him. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, John starts in chapter 12 by showing us Jesus is a king, but not like people would expect. See, the crowds, they thought Jesus was a national king. Do you see that in verse 12? The next day, the great crowd, uh, Josephus, he's a Jewish historian at the time, he tells us that at, at Passover, which is the f- the festival that was coming up. At Passover, the city of Jerusalem could swell to like 2.7 million people. So for reference, picture the population of Toronto coming up to Jerusalem to celebrate Passover. These great crowds hear that Jesus is now coming into town, and they begin shouting. They shout, Hosanna, which as Craig said a little earlier, literally can mean just save us. Like, here he comes, here's the king, save us, it's time, deliver us. But over time, it just became a term of praise, Hosanna, praise God. And the Jewish people, as Passover and other festivals came up, they would, they would go back to Psalm 118, that's where it's taken from, and they would, they would sing these songs, Hosanna. They say, blessed Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is the king of Israel. And and they put these palm branches down, which at that time it was this Jewish symbol, this this patriotic symbol that that, uh, Israel, Israel is the dominant nation. And they themselves describe Jesus as a king. Jesus, for his part, he, he doesn't even try to change their opinion. They think he's a national king. And then Jesus finds a donkey, verse 14, and he sits on it. You might wonder, what, what's that all about? Well, John tells us in verse 15, he, he's portraying what the prophet Zechariah talked about. Do not be afraid, daughter Zion. See, your king is coming to you seated on a donkey's colt. And so the crowds... They think Jesus is a national king. And Jesus, by getting onto a donkey, shows them he's a peaceful king. Jesus is a peaceful king. And you might think, where, where's he getting that from? Well, if you were to go to, to the prophecy that John quotes, that's Zechariah chapter 9, you get the passage he just said, Rejoice greatly, daughter Zion. Shout, daughter Jerusalem. See, your king to, comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly, and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey, But then there's another verse. I will take away the chariots from Ephraim and the war horses from Jerusalem and the battle bow will be broken. He will proclaim peace to the nations. His rule will extend from sea to sea and from the river to the ends of the earth. See, Jesus doesn't ride into town on a war horse ready to end the drought for Jerusalem and take out the Romans. No, he comes humbly, lowly, on a donkey's colt. Jesus is a peaceful king. And so uh, the crowds think he's a national king. Jesus shows them he's a peaceful king. The disciples, 
the disciples don't understand a thing. <laughs> Verse 16, at first his disciples did not understand all this. They don't get it. Only after Jesus was glorified did they realize that these things had been written about him and that these things had been done to him. There's that word glorified again, uh, talking about how Jesus knew in order to be perfectly obedient to his father, he had to die. He had to go to the cross, he had to suffer, and then he had to rise again, and then he would be glorified. And how many times now, how many times have we read in John that the disciples just didn't get it? Chapter 2, chapter 7, chapter 12, they don't realize what's going on, and what John has been trying to to help us understand those, those who would read his gospel, his good news about Jesus Christ later on. What he wants us to see is that until you look at the story of the Bible through the lens of Jesus' death and resurrection, you can't fully understand the story. See, in Jesus' mind, it was always about coming to Easter. Easter. It was always about the cross. It was always about giving his life and rising again. It's a little bit like when you watch a movie with an amazing plot twist. You watch and you're like, what's going on here? What's going on here? What's going on? And then you get to the end, you're like, it was him the whole time? Are you kidding me? When we read the story of the Bible, we're, what's going on here? What's going on here? <laughs> Boom, Easter. He dies. He rises? What's going on here? That was the plan all along. And until we see that the plan was always Easter, we, like the disciples, we just don't understand. And by the way, we can push that application just a little further. Until you see your life in light of God's story, you can't fully understand You don't realize his purpose for you. The disciples don't get it, but they would get it after he was glorified. A few more people who come to see Jesus, verse 17 through 22, many people want to see Jesus. See, many people just want to see something. Okay, what's he going to do next? Verse 17, do you remember when Pastor Nate, uh, a few weeks ago, he preached on John 11 when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead? Well, here, this is just after that, a whole bunch of people were now following Jesus because of that amazing event. And as they told more and more people, did you hear this guy raise the man from the dead? More people are now following Jesus. In verse 17, verse 18, they're, they're just here to see. They want to see him perform a sign. It gets to the point where even the Pharisees in verse 19, it's like they throw in the white flag, they're, they're waving it, and the whole world's gone after him. What do we do with this guy? Everybody loves him. Even people who weren't of Jewish background wanted to get their eyes on this Jewish king. They wanted to just see what he's all about. Verse 20, some Greeks come. uh, They were worshiping. In other words, they were God-fearers. They believed in God, the Jewish God. But then they heard about this Jesus, and they wanted to see about him. So they asked Philip, can, can you get us a VIP showing with him? He talks to Andrew, they both talk to Jesus, and then Jesus brings this message. He he says these crucial words in verse 23. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. There's that word again. Do you remember the whole time he's been saying, it's not my time yet. His brothers want him to go up to the festival and just announce that he's the king. He says, it's not my time. Peter, it's not my time. The hour has come, Jesus says here. It is my time. Let's do this. I'm going to be glorified. I'm going to the cross. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. See, Jesus' contemporaries, the people that lived with him, they understood there was something significant about him. The, the crowds as he's coming in and are, they're putting palms down, they, they're comparing him there to the Messiah, this long-expected Savior, Deliverer, King, anointed one by God to save their people. They actually compare him to King David. 
and the crowds are, are rife with expectation. They, they know there is something significant about this Jesus. You see, in, in his day, the question was never whether he had authority. Jesus, Jesus is a king, but he's a different king than people expect. Uh, I said a little earlier, all, all the Jewish people wanted was this military messiah, a, a Chuck Norris kind of guy who was ready to take out Caesar and stomp on all his little minions. And 200 years before Jesus, they almost got that guy. His nickname, Judas the Hammer. What a nickname. Judas the Hammer. And he starts, well, imagine what he does. <laughs> he battles the Greeks, he battles the Romans, he gets to the point where he actually clears out the temple and gets it rededicated to God, and the Jews think, maybe this is our guy, and he uses a hammer. But Jesus, Jesus is a different kind of king. You see, Jesus wasn't just trying to be the king of one nation, Israel. He wasn't even trying to be the king of all the nations. Jesus was building a kingdom that's not of this world. And so, instead of coming in on a war horse, he rides in on a donkey, and it's supposed to signify that he's a different kind of king. He's a humble king. And his weapon of choice, it wasn't a hammer. It was a cross. But he didn't use that cross to inflict violence on someone else. No, he served. He allows himself to be put on that cross. And don't be mistaken, he tells Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world, and if I wanted to, and my angels would be here to rescue me, but I have to go to the cross. I'm going to let you inflict this violence on me. And Isaiah, Isaiah tells us that because he bore that punishment on himself, he won peace for all of us. Jesus is the king of peace. Jesus ended all wars by giving his life. And you might think, well, he, how did he end all wars? There's war going on right now. Because that moment, Easter Sunday, was the beginning of the end. And yes, there's still a battle going on, a spiritual battle and physical battles. But that humble king who came to save us is coming again to be the judge and to put an end to all that violence, all that strife, once and for all. Jesus is a different kind of king. The kind who gives his life for his people. That's who King Jesus is. And, and as we look at the story, th this is the point where the story crosses into our lives. Because I have a feeling that, that for some of us, just like the disciples who misunderstood Jesus, our perception of Jesus is off. See, some of us, we, we want Jesus to be a king who, who serves our agenda. Our demands for his priorities, our ambitions, our interests. And, and one really practical example, and I, I want to tread really lightly here, but some of us, some of us even still want Jesus to get Caesar thrown off the throne. We've made it our, our life's purpose to just, what, Christianity, uh, Jesus, God's kingdom needs to be the kingdom in Canada. We, we need a new prime minister. Jesus needs to be king. And the truth is, Jesus doesn't want to be the king of Canada or the prime minister. He's building a spiritual kingdom, an eternal kingdom that's going to go far beyond the nations. And yes, the nations will be called to account. And he will overturn governments. But what Jesus wants more than that agenda is he wants you. He wants your heart. He wants your service. And he wants you 
to influence the culture for Christ. Not your agenda. Paul takes this idea of our humble service to King Jesus, and he runs with it. He uses the analogy of a soldier. He's talking to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 2. Here's what he says. You then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things you heard me say in the presence of many witnesses, entrust to reliable people who will also be qualified to teach others. Now get this, ready? Join with me in suffering. Like a good soldier of Christ Jesus. No one serving as a soldier gets entangled in civilian affairs, but rather tries to please his commanding officer. See, I believe it's possible to get so caught up in what Paul calls civilian affairs, the things going on in our world, we forget what's really important. The gospel. The good news about Jesus Christ. Being in relationship with him, loving him, loving other people, and sharing this news about him. And when, when you hold on to the soldier part that Paul is talking about, and you have a mission, but, but you leave out the gospel part, Christ, well, that is how religion is abused in the name of Jesus. And now don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you there aren't tragic issues going on in our world. I'm not saying don't worry about Ukraine. I'm not telling you don't, don't care about politics in our country. Uh, use your right to vote. We have a vote coming up this spring, this summer. Influence those around you, but remember what's really important. To love Christ, to serve Christ, and, and to share Christ with other people. And uh, one just so practical, real-life example for us. Uh, a, a few weeks back, we, we prayed over Kim, and, and she's going to hate me for doing this, because she told me, I, I don't feel very amazing about this, and I, I don't want attention for this, but she, she's this is a young person who, who sees that the devastation and the injustice going on in Ukraine and just packs her bags and, and goes, says, I'm going to just help people in Jesus' name. I'm going to do whatever I can. And so let's take our cue from people like Kim. Because Jesus says in verse 26, whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am my servant will also be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. What a promise. But there's a second way that we can misunderstand Jesus, and it's some of us, we, we've never gotten to the whoever serves me must also follow me. Kind of like the crowds, the Greeks who, who came to see Jesus, we're, we're just sort of here to check them out. <laughs> we come to church, or, or once in a while we'll see something online, and, and that's about the extent of it. We're, we're just here to watch. We're like the little girl who went to the Blue Jays' home opener, a pastor was saying. And, and her dad gives her a glove so that she can catch a ball, and she just starts crying. Oh, sweetie, what's wrong? Daddy, I didn't know they expected me to play. <laughs> I'm just here to watch. <laughs> and some of us is like, Jesus, look what he's offering us. He says God will honor us. He says that we can be with him forever. And some of us are like, no, 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 I I'm just here to watch. And now don't get me wrong. There's a, a season when you just need to, to see what Jesus is all about. Some of you are in that season, you're just, you're investigating, you're intrigued, you're curious, we love that. We're thankful that you do that, but, but there comes a point where Jesus says, okay, the invitation, the invitation is to follow me. Did you see what he said in verse 25 there? Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Jesus is calling us to, to deny ourselves, to deny uh, our self-interest. See, until we get to the place where the thing we need most is Jesus and nothing else really matters in comparison to him, all our other pursuits will be found wanting. Our career, our relationships, our hobbies, we just won't have the same fulfillment without Jesus. And when you hear 
a message like this, I know that some of us are thinking, why? Why should I? How, how can this king, how can Jesus demand this much from me? And well, the short answer is because Jesus led by example. He went first. He didn't just bid his servants to do all his dirty work. He led the way. He was on the front lines. Did you hear that analogy he gives? Uh, a kernel of wheat on its own, when you just see it there, it's a single seed. But when you put it in the ground, when it dies, fruit is produced. Jesus says, I'm that seed. When I lay down my life, many more will come from this. And then the very next chapter, John chapter 13, what does he do? He humbles himself. He washes his disciples' feet. John chapter 15, he says, okay, I'm going to go lay my life down for you because a, a good friend, a great friend, lays his life down for his friends. Jesus went first and he did that. The biggest reason why he lays down his life is because he loves us. Because he wanted us to have a relationship with him. And now parents, how deflating is it when you give every ounce of energy you have, you, you pour into your kids, and then they say something like, you never do anything for me. Or all they do every day is just demand more from you. It's deflating. But here's the beautiful thing about Jesus, our King. Even though sometimes we treat him like, like spoiled children, he doesn't just punish us. He shows us grace. He continues to love us. He continues to pursue us and say, I still want you. Even though you, you, you're not appreciating me, I, I still get so much joy from a relationship with you. Jesus says, where I am, there my servants will be as well. He, his whole goal, what he wants for you, is relationship. And so, there will come a day when we'll get to the end of the world or, or the end of our lives. And for those of us who learn to appreciate that love, who, who trusted in Jesus, will be welcomed into his presence forever. Jesus even says that God will honor us for serving him. But there will be some. There will be some who refuse that offer. And Jesus says that eventually... He's going to come back a second time and, and there will be a judgment. And I'm going to guess that right away this is a hang-up for some people with Christianity. What, what kind of God says, love me or I'll just send you to hell? And the answer is it's, it's a God who knows you and who loves you and realizes you, what's best for you better than you ever could and, and sees the way that, that your life is going and if you're honest with him, it's not going as well as you had hoped for. And so Jesus, Jesus, he says, well, look at, look at some of his final words. End of John chapter 12. If anyone hears my words but does not keep them, I do not judge that person. For I did not come to judge the world but to save the world. The first time he comes, he comes to save the world. But then he says, there is a judge for the one who rejects me and does not accept my words. The very words I have spoken will condemn them on the last day. See, some of us will just keep on refusing God's offer and saying no and saying no. And, and I don't say this because it's, it's fun to tell you this. Uh, I don't say this to try to manipulate, manipulate you or, or strong arm you into a relationship with God. It's, it's honestly, I hope you'll hear me. It's because I love you. Jesus tells us that if you tell God no long enough, eventually he, he lets you be. C.S. Lewis says that that's, that's what hell is. It's life without God. But that's not what God wants for you. He went 
to the greatest sacrifice of sending his son into the world so you would never have to experience life without him. He loves you too much for that. He wants you. With all your flaws, even though we've turned our back on him, he wants you. And my fear, my fear is that some of us look at Jesus the way I used to view Queen Elizabeth. Why should I care? She's the queen of England. She's not my queen. But Jesus is your king. He's not just king of a nation. He's king of the nations. And he's the king of your life. Again, I tell you this because truthfully, you need to know it. Uh, Trust me, (laughs) these aren't my favorite messages. And... It's not some propaganda that I get paid to preach. It's actually the reason why I got into ministry and realized that that there's nothing else I could possibly do but preach this message. God loves you, and he wants you. And I just pray you'll be ready the next time the king comes. Let's pray. Father, When we hear words like judgment in the Bible, it it can be a scary thought. It can even be a thought that frustrates us and, and puts our guard up. But Lord, I pray we wouldn't just hear the judgment part of that. I pray we would hear the grace. That that your goal, your desire is never that we would be punished. It's that we would believe in your son. You made us to be in relationship with you. You designed us to find our ultimate purpose in you through Christ. And you went first. Jesus gave his life so that we could have life. I pray that that would move us. We wouldn't uh, feel this sense of obligation like like military duty to, to serve without joy or happiness. But Lord, we would be so grateful that we would give anything for Jesus. Father, I pray that we would see the blessing of relationship with you. This Palm Sunday, this Holy Week, as we go into a week where we reflect on everything that your son went through to bring us to you, I pray, Lord, we'd be filled with reverence, with awe, and that we'd worship this king. What a privilege it is to be sons and daughters of the king. In his precious name I pray, amen.